Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Center for Healthy Sex. I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, and this is Mirror of Intimacy, Daily Reflections on Emotional and Erotic Intelligence. Um, today's is June 1st, but I'm going to talk about the topic for June 2nd, which is conditioning. Um, and I think this is an important topic, um, especially today, as we are seeing what's going on in the world. So where conditioning is concerned, the, um, again, and this is tomorrow's um, entry, June 2nd, the uh, quote for the day is from Butch Hancock, who says, life in Lubbock, Texas taught me two things. One is that God loves you and you're going to burn in hell. The other is that sex is the most awful, filthy thing on earth and you should save it for someone you love. And of course, there are two wild contradictions in that. One that um, is, rec is sort of exemplifies the kind of conditioning that we can learn uh, from the time we're very young. And then we carry these beliefs into our adulthood, even though they don't serve us any longer. And conditioning starts really in the third trimester of pregnancy. Um, and we have plenty of data to show this. There's a documentary that's well known called In Utero that you can take a look at. But basically what's happening in utero is that there is a neurochemical communication, you could say, between the mother and the infant. So if the mother is stressed out, if she's depressed, if she is being abused in some ways, if she's lonely or hungry, whatever's happening in her own physiology is being transmitted through the placenta into the emerging infant's nervous system. And as such, the infant is being conditioned from the get-go. And these are what we call the genetic and the epigenetic conditions taking place. Epigenetics talks about the way the genes express themselves. So if genes are going to express themselves in a healthy way, then that's what will happen. But if the mother is under stress or duress, a gene that might have been healthy can become distorted because of that stress and distress. And so we know that this kind of conditioning comes from both nature and nurture. But once that infant is born, the primary caregiver, typically the mother's ability to take care of that infant, to regulate it, to soothe it, to meet its needs when um, it's upset um, or crying, or um, typically crying and upset are the same thing with an infant because it's its only language for um, asking for help. The, the ability for the parental caregiver to respond to that infant in a contingent way, in a way that has that infant getting its needs met pretty quickly allows for that infant's brain and nervous system to grow capacity. So the baby cries and the primary caregiver goes to the baby to see what's wrong and it soothes the baby by feeding it or changing its diaper and then all is well again. But the baby's capacity to tolerate that upset keeps growing because every time there is a rupture or an upset, it's repaired, it's taken care of, the baby soothes. So over time, that baby grows into a child and it can understand and, and, and tolerate pauses or frustration or has patience because it knows that it can hold and wait and eventually it will get what it needs. And in adulthood, that makes a big difference. So for example, if you were hungry right now, and you couldn't get food, you know, in this second, and you started melting down, that would mean that you were conditioned to not be able to tolerate hunger. Um, and if you were conditioned to tolerate, you would know you were hungry, but in 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, you would get yourself something to eat and it was going to be okay. You wouldn't start to uh, become so dysregulated that you were in a rage or a meltdown. So, that kind of um, neurobiological explanation is one form of conditioning. And it's a very important form of conditioning because it telegraphs who we're gonna become in the world. Because if our bodies aren't regulated, 
we can feel like we're going insane. We will, quote, lose our minds because we cannot have good heart rate variability. We can't tolerate any kind of upset or perturbation in the system. Um, and so when we can't tolerate that, we will do something to make it go away. And sometimes that something is not particularly useful or healthy, especially when we're talking about addiction. But um, this childhood conditioning, though, once the infant turns into a toddler, is essential for our growth and development. Uh, when the baby starts to toddle away from the mother, when the baby starts to take its own shape as a person, for the first time, the mother and the baby are separate. Um, they're perceived, the baby perceives itself separate from the mother. And that's the first time that the baby also sees, you know, upset in the mother's face. You know, no, because it's doing something that could potentially hurt it. Um, and that's when we start to get these conditioned messages about what's okay, what's not okay. And some of that is, again, is essential because it's pro-social. We learn not to put our hand on a hot stove. We learn that it's not okay to bite someone else or to hit someone else. Um, we would have massive chaos at all times if we didn't grow up learning how to be polite, how to um, share, how to you know, be tolerant of our neighbors. And at some point though, um, if we're starting to be given false messages, the way Butch Hancock talks about that, you know, God loves you, but you're going to hell, or sex is dirty and filthy, but save it for marriage, um, then we're going to be in trouble. Because really, as adults, we have to take responsibility to think about, well, what of those conditioned messages do I want to, you know, agree with and believe in? And what of them do I not? Because if they're starting to create pain um, in your life, these messages that you got growing up, these ways of being, then you really want to examine them and you want to start to deconstruct them also so that you have some kind of critical thinking about, well, why do I think that? And <clears throat> we get this conditioning from our parents, our teachers, our neighbors, um, our churches, our peers, the media, politicians. I mean, the list goes on and on. We become a, a quilt or a mosaic of all of the cultural messages around us, which can often be confusing because the development of a self requires space. It requires quiet. It requires both input, paradoxically, from the people around us who raise us um, so that we understand that we're good and we're whole and we're perfect and we're capable uh, so we can be confident in the world. But it also gets impinged upon by our peer group and the culture at large. If, however, you grew up in an abusive situation, you probably didn't get messages or weren't conditioned to believe you were good. In fact, growing up in a violent household, whether it's emotionally or physically violent, can have a child feeling dirty and defective um, and like there's something wrong with their very self because of the massive amount of shame that accompanies that kind of abuse. And again, that's a different kind of conditioning. So the conditioning can be implicit. It can be from the moment um, we are in our mother's body uh, before birth and we're getting these neurochemical messages of stress and anxiety or depression um, and it's conditioned all the way through our lives so we have to be critical thinkers about well, why do I believe that and how do I feel about that and particularly now when we're seeing all of the violence that we're seeing you know on television and in the media um, the violence against black bodies, the violence in the streets protesting the violence against black bodies. And it, it brings up all sorts of confusing messages and feelings. And to be able to get quiet and say, well, who am I? What do I believe? What really feels right and what feels wrong in my own heart is different than what I'm told I should believe by the media or by our friends and family. Um, and this is kind of a glaring uh, experience right now 
uh, for you to play with and to think about. So as usual, if you have any questions along the way, uh, feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, and if you want to um, ask a question anonymously, uh, you can do so uh, by looking, uh, by typing them into the Q&A box or writing them directly to Melisa, which I believe she's put that information up there, her email address, um, if you don't want to be identified on this um, webinar. So when you start to think about um, you know, what these messages are um, and <clears throat> how they've been ingrained in us, you have to sort of sit quietly and ask yourself, well, how do I feel about that belief? Um, someone said, how do I change my beliefs, which is a very, you know, broad-based question um, and not, um, not easy to answer. Uh, but one of the ways you can change them is by asking yourself, whether they're true or not. Is this really true? Or is this just popping into my head? And how do I feel in my heart when I think that belief? Because beliefs are thoughts and they are patterned behaviors. And do I really believe that thought? You know, that I don't like um, <clears throat> all white cats because once I had a white cat that was kind of crazy and it would scratch. And so do I then just denigrate the entire species of white cats and say, I just hate all white cats? Or can I be discerning and saying, that was a bad cat. That cat wasn't well for a whole host of reasons. Um, it was born into a litter and it, and it was, you know, I rescued it from a house where there were, I don't know how many cats living in that house and the cat was riddled with fleas and it was sick when I got it and it was a bad rescue, honestly, but um, I took care of the cat, but he wasn't well because he probably had worms when he was really young and he was distorted, but that doesn't mean all white cats are vicious or dangerous cats. So to query ourselves is important. Someone says, how do you discern between conditioning and better judgment when you don't know what the better judgment is? And I think that goes back to the same thing that, you know, what is my best judgment? And um, I've been conditioned to believe a certain thing, whatever that thing is. And were my parents right about that? Or was that just part of their upbringing and it just got handed down? And does that really resonate for me? When I look around me, does that feel like the right thing or the wrong thing? Does that hurt my heart? Um, does it make me wince or make me think, oh, that's kind of embarrassing? And if so, what other thought or judgment or belief might I adapt to see what would be right? And it's very challenging right now because our country is super polarized. Everything is politicized now, including a virus. You know, getting sick is a political uh, issue now. Um, and so to turn off the noise, to turn off the television and the media, and to get quiet and say, what is the right thing for me to do? What is the right way for me to behave when I go out into the world? What makes me feel good about myself and what makes me feel shameful or embarrassing, or like maybe I'm hurting myself and hurting other people. Um, so someone states negative conditioning in early childhood is ingrained deeply and resistant to change. What strategies do you suggest for the deconditioning of these ingrained negative emotionality, charged beliefs and visceral responses? Well, I think in some of the ways that I've been talking about is that they can be resistant to change, but I think if we dig deeply, if we get quiet and go to the foundation of who we are, then we can start to deconstruct some of these messages and beliefs. So when you think about some of the promises you've made to yourself or some of the beliefs that you've held so tightly, and to ask yourself, is this really true for me right now? Or is this hamstringing me in some ways? Because we grow and change over time. And just as when children are small and parents make rules that you have to have all the doors and windows locked um, and you can't let that child out of your sight, that's super important when the child is two and three years old. 
But when the child is 14 and 15 years old, that becomes constraining to the child and to the parent because the parent now is no longer behaving as a steward of the child, they're becoming a jailer of the child. And so I think that our seasons um, or our beliefs have seasons that we hold. What I believed for myself when I was 30 is not what I believed for myself when I was 50. So we must constantly be reevaluating what's true for ourselves today. Um, and that's the best way um, that we can start to manage and look at these needs. So someone writes, my husband and I are in our mid forties and haven't had sex for more than seven years. It's been infrequent. I've had desire to have sex with other men, but not him. Um, I cringe when my husband touches me. I prefer fantasy to reality, etc. How can I overcome my fear of intimacy? Um, so it seems to me, I mean, this is a very long, you know, involved question for this format, but it seems to me that um, you would do well to be an in individual therapy to answer questions like that. You know, cringing from somebody's touch really has to do with intimacy and to look at what is it about your avoidance in your own system? Where does that avoidance come from? When was it conditioned? How long have you let that pattern go on also? Um, because at some point we have to admit that these are our patterns. You know, many years ago I heard a well-regarded scientist, truly, whose expertise was in eating and eating disorders at a conference who said that he had published numerous papers on this theory that he had and recently he learned that his theory was wrong and he had to admit that it was wrong and so that was really bold and i had so much respect for this person and came to understand over time that that's how all scientists are they're willing to have their theories disproved that's what makes good science so likewise when you have a belief that you've held or it's what your parents said and it was set in stone it's some religious belief that doesn't really hang together anymore for you like a good scientist you have to deconstruct it and say you know what maybe i was wrong about that or maybe that person i put a lot of faith in or that politician i voted for is not really who they said they were or yeah, I thought it was a good idea at that time, but today it's not a good idea because you've probably noticed that things are changing incredibly rapidly right now on the planet. And if we're not nimble in our thinking and flexible and willing to say, oh, what I thought was okay or true is no longer true, then we're going to get, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to suffer, I think, greatly. So one of the ways we can do this is, is to deconstruct these thoughts in the presence of a trusted other, like a therapist or a 12 step group, but also to start to meditate, to sit quietly and to ask yourself, is this thought true? Is this agreement I made with this person still hold water or has it become dated? Is it worn out? Do I have to have a difficult conversation and say, this is not working for me anymore. And I know I made an agreement, and I don't want to just bail out on it, but I want to be honest with you about what my needs are at this time. Um, and that will start to free you from some of the shackles. Um, hi, Scott. Scott says, you talked about the inability to tolerate discomfort. And is this caused by growing up, never getting your needs met and or otherwise getting your needs met immediately? Um, I would say yes, because this discomfort is in the autonomic nervous system. It's in the body. Um, so the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal column and the autonomic nervous system really has to do with managing the physical body. And so when this discomfort arises um, about not getting needs met, like I can't stand being alone or I'm lonely or I'm scared or I'm hungry and I have to eat right now. Okay, that might mean that you have low blood sugar and fair enough, but this inability to hold and wait, to pause, to take a beat, really has to do with low frustration tolerance because someone wasn't there to soothe that baby immediately, to take care of that baby, to regulate that baby until that baby became a child and an adult over time that could self-regulate, that could manage um, these upsets or these feelings that come and go. Um, you're right. Likewise, if somebody was just treated 
um, you know, and pandered to constantly when instead of, you know, by the time they were uh, 14, they were still being treated like they were three or four. That can be a problem also because that person then becomes what's um, sort of kind of colloquially known in the 12 step program as King Baby. That person wants what they want when they want it and they can't tolerate not getting it and they go into a rage if they don't get it. Um, so this is at some point as adults, we have to start to reparent ourselves. We have to look at our own conditioning um, and start to say, wait a minute, is that really true? And how can I be a more functional adult? How can I take a deep breath and maybe call a friend or take a walk or do something else instead of lunging at the people around me, expecting them to take care of me right now? So this is, again, sort of complicated because um, <clears throat> there's a book written by um, a doctor whose last name is Murthy, M-U-R-T-H-Y, about um, loneliness and how loneliness is a physiological response. It's a pain like hunger. And so if we are lonely, our body is telling us that we need comfort and connection and touch. But that doesn't mean we go act out sexually or we use somebody <clears throat> to get our needs met. It means that we start to recognize that, oh, I need touch or I need comfort and I need to ask for it appropriately to help get those needs met. So Monica says, what are some of the factors associated with men who seem unable to be faithful to their spouses in the sense that it's a compulsive as opposed to a one-time mistake. Well, I think that Monica talks to what I've been talking about. It has to do with affect dysregulation, the inability to manage one's mood, one's upset, um, one's feelings of loneliness, um, and extreme difficulty with being um, intimate, which has them then quote, acting out their feelings sexually because they didn't learn that they could ask for help, ask for a hug, um, ask for tenderness or care because they couldn't get it in the families they grew up in. And that's sort of a simplistic definition, but um, I delineate this quite specifically in my book, Sex Addiction as Affect Dysregulation, which you can find on Amazon. And Cheryl said, epigenetics is the emotion of the parent while pregnant is passed on to the baby. This exposes the baby to the parent's emotions and the baby takes on and becomes the emotion. No, epigenetics means the, the impact of the environment on the expression of the gene. So if the mother is highly anxious during pregnancy and especially that third trimester of pregnancy, then that anxiety, that high, what we call sympathetic arousal in the nervous system, that vibrating energy is going to be dispensed into the baby's emerging nervous system. And so she's gonna give birth to a highly anxious baby, and then she's not going to be able to regulate that baby because she's anxious herself. So it's not just exposing the baby to the parent's emotions. The emotions are getting downloaded into these circuits. Um, and so we all take on our mother's attachment strategies at birth. It can largely be no other way. These are evolutionary mechanisms. Um, and so this is why it's very challenging for young mothers and fathers to be alone with an infant. It, this is why extended families are so important to have people that can take over, people that are more regulated, calmer, um, you know, that can soothe the baby when you know, the mother can't, especially if the mother is, has postpartum depression or something along those lines. So yes, this is what happens. Um, and someone writes, could death of my twin sister at three days have much effect on my future? I would say an enormous effect on your future. And if you look in the literature, you'll see um, that there's a lot written about twinship and what happens when a twin dies in utero or after birth, um, that's a massive breach to the attachment system um, because you were in utero with that emerging um, cell and with that baby later um, for nine months. So that's a, a massive grief and loss from the get-go. And I imagine that your mother was probably pretty distraught also. 
And someone says, when it comes to the process of deconditioning, how much attention and time should be paid to understanding and really digging into the source of your initial conditioning compared to how much you should be focusing on the beliefs you want going forward? Sometimes I'm not sure if I'm fixating on the past of my childhood or a way to avoid doing the hard work of moving forward. Well, that's a complicated question because it's both and. You know, unless you really do the deeper work of feeling the feelings today that you couldn't feel then, it's very difficult to create neural integration and to change these patterns on a deep, deep level. So just doing it cognitively, trying to change your thoughts when internally the system is behaving in the same way is sort of like putting lipstick on a pig, as the saying goes. You really have to do the deeper work. And at some point, your, your thoughts and your, your um, beliefs start to change as you start to feel healthier. So working with affirmations and writing and changing your thoughts while you're doing the depth work is essential. So there's really a shuttling back and forth. It's not um, one or the other. It's really both and. Um, and that ties to the question of the process of reconditioning. Um, you know, it, it really is about being vigilant about these thoughts because these negative thoughts fire off all the time and they're regressive. When you feel like you're under siege or you're under attack, you're going to get scared and you're going to regress to what you know. And with that will come these negative thoughts that start to fire off. But if you can breathe and get into the body, all of this has to do with getting into your body and noticing what am I feeling in my chest? What do I feel in my gut? What am I feeling in my limbs? Am I hot, cold, shivering, scared, terrified, feel sick to my stomach? That's what's most important. That's what you should have your attention on. The thoughts are secondary to that. Um, the thoughts will tell you all sorts of stories but that doesn't really get to the main event. So when you have a thought that seems bizarre or it's an old thought or it's your parents' thought, you have to ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? And get interested in the feeling, not the story around the feeling. Um, and someone's asking here about to, to getting heart-centered and getting quiet. Um, and so the question is whether what I'm feeling belongs to me or is conditioned. Um, if I don't have access to my heart, I'm just unaware of the fact or distrusting. And another issue feels when I get quiet, I often uh, get so swept up in either past trauma or conditioned association of fantasy and feel numb the closer to a sense of self. Well, then at this juncture, maybe that kind of meditation is not good for you. Um, if what's happening is you're dissociating, uh, you would do much better off to be in some sort of somatic or trauma-based therapy. Um, and someone says, what is the evolutionary function of high anxiety, mothers producing high anxiety baby? Well, there is no evolutionary function. The fact is that uh, whatever this hypothetical mother I'm talking about, if she's anxious, that anxiety came from somewhere. She was abused or lived in a high anxiety household. These are intergenerational transmissions of trauma. What's evolutionary is that the mother is conditioning the emerging infant's brain and nervous system. It's just how we work as human beings. Um, we are uh, gregarious creatures. Infants are 100% dependent on their caregivers for their brains and nervous systems to develop and come to fruition. And if the adults aren't regulated, if they're not calm, if they're not able to meet that infant and that infant's needs, then they are gonna distort that nervous system in whatever way they're distorted. That's not optimally how this evolutionary mechanism is supposed to work. We're supposed to be able to be secure and to securely bring our infants into um, healthy childhood. Um, <clears throat> someone writes, I'm an ACA, um, adult child of an alcoholic, um, works multiple 12-step programs. Um, what might this indicate about my childhood conditioning? Well, I would say that you suffered a lot of abuse is what that would indicate. Um, all of that compulsivity speaks to a high level of dysregulation um, and that you are always looking to something to, um, to manage that. 
So I would think that you would have to have a lot, a lot of um, structure around you, not just programs, but possibly medication, therapy, hobbies, um, people around you that care for you um, so that you're not trying to just manage all of this on your own. Um, and then someone says, what about women who seek to have affairs with men who are wealthy and seem to be very deliberate about their how they target men? Um, well, I'm not sure what the question is about that, but someone who has a history of doing that um, and is problematic, if that's problematic for them, um, they have to look at uh, their eroticized rage and what my colleague Deborah Kaplan calls monetized rage. And how are you acting out against men? Um, where is your anger at men? Um, and why is it that you feel like you deserve to get something from men by way of your sexuality and using men for money? Um, that's definitely a, um, an issue that is addressed in sex and love addiction programs. Um, and these are attachment breaches also. And someone says, as you work on regulation, uh, affect regulation and deconditioning with clients, how do you suggest helping them to move forward in actualizing new beliefs despite a long history of acting on previous conditioned beliefs? Well, I think that happens naturally. Um, I think as people start to feel more regulated, they start to have more neural integration, they feel less anxious, less depressed, less impulsive, those thoughts change naturally. We start to develop a sense of self that belongs uniquely to us because we're not carrying the shame of our family of origin. Um, and so the negative messages and insecurities that previously, or messages that previously masked our insecurities and our inadequacies just naturally start to fall away. Uh, because beliefs are really the domain of the left brain and you can easily have a belief, but it's not, that belief is not necessarily encoded in the nervous system. When you start to deconstruct the pain of the trauma of the past, and you start to feel your system coming into congruence, there is a felt sense in the core part of the body. Um, people report things like feeling lighthearted or open-hearted or open in the core of my being, um, less tense, less depressed, less disembodied then the thoughts naturally change. People start to move into feelings of gratitude, of confidence, um, of, you know, just a general positivity. Um, and how do you break the generational curse of sexual abuse and child molestation? My bi biological mother and I both experienced these abuses. I don't have children yet, but I often worry about having them out of fear uh, that they'll be abused. Well, the only answer to that is to work on your own abuse and to um, really dig deeply into the core of that and what that did to you and how that has you feeling and all of your fears and your terror that's been dissociated and um, really, really doing the work and, and your therapy. And you'll know, you'll know when those previous images of arousal that are disturbing to you, uh, when the previous patterns of um, repeating something over and over again are no longer powerful over you, you'll know when it's time for you to have a child um, and that you will do something different. But it's very dangerous to um, create some kind of spiritual or psychological bypass on that and to think that you're just going to do it differently because the truth is you'll find out that you won't. Um, and so I appreciate your question and I appreciate your conscientiousness about wanting to do something different, to change that conditioning. And I think that's what people do, like all of you that are on this webinar that are saying, I really want to do something different. I want to change. I don't want to um, continue to do this, that the buck stops here. And so by changing your own patterns, by really scrupulously identifying down to the foundation, to the core of your being, who you are, without the carried shame of your abuse, then you start to liberate yourself and then you liberate the next generation. 
And someone asks, can, you basically, can I basically quote normal childhood with average parents to lead to bad conditioning just because moms and dads have their own issues like all human beings? Well, I would say, you know, how are you defining bad? Um, look, many of us didn't come from family of households. We came from households that were, um, our parents were insensitive because of the culture they grew up in or the generation they grew up in. They didn't sit down and talk to their children or ask them how they were or really try to understand them during their teenage years. It was like, they're just the kids and you know, your parents were hard workers. They kept a roof over your head. There was no real ism in the household to speak of. But it doesn't mean that you didn't suffer in some ways if you were quite sensitive because you didn't feel seen or heard or understood or maybe even loved, even though you knew they loved you, but they never said it. And so that can start to, that can create a certain kind of conditioning where we feel um, like we kind of live in a very narrow band or we don't get very excited about things because our parents were sort of more quiet or bookish or puritanical or um, they privileged let's say they privileged education over everything. And so you never really got to play or do fun things. So you have a hard time with excitement, for example. Whatever the conditioning is, we can all feel it. We all know what it is. We feel it in our bodies. And so that is the clue of where to start. Like, huh, how come I don't ever get excited? Why don't I ever jump for joy? Why am I always just kind of blah? Um, or why do I, um, you know, judge people so harshly all the time? Like I see people on the street and I'm like, oh, I don't like her hair. I don't like her this, or I don't like her that, or that's dumb. Like, you, and, and then you stop and think about it and think, well, God, my mother was so judgmental. Of course I'm judgmental. And I'm also judgmental on myself, it turns out. I'm really mean to myself. I say mean things to myself. Wow, none of this is me. This was all inherited. Huh, how am I going to get out of this? Because I am sick of being so judgmental and harsh on myself. And of course, the answer to that is it starts with you. The minute you hear those judgments in your head, you have to say stop and replace them with a positive affirmation. The minute you hear yourself judging somebody on the street, you have to say stop and instead, you know, positively affirm that person. And just start to play around with these things and see how things start to shift and change for you. Um, somebody early met, uh, earlier mentioned the four agreements. Um, and one of the four agreements is, you know, to be impeccable with your word um, and to not be, um, to make assumptions and to be harsh on other people. Um, and so that's where you can start to change these things. Um, and then regarding eroticized rage, uh, and targeting powerful, wealthy men. I'm curious, isn't it also evolutionary advantageous to have a man who knows how to practice an abundance of resource? Well, I think being with a man who's a provider is one thing, but preying on wealthy men um, and powerful men or hitching your wagon to that um, can create problems for anyone over time because it's, there's a power differential there. It's not a level playing field. And usually it's a case of mutual usury, um, especially when you're looking at the realm of the whole sugar baby movement where you have older wealthy men that are involved with very young, like young women in their 20s. So the exchange is sex for money. And if that's the agreement that you're in and you're okay with that agreement, then it's your life, it's not a problem. Um, but yes, I mean, there's studies that show very clearly that Males are attracted to females of, you know, that look like they have good childbearing capabilities. And females are attracted to males that appear to be good providers. But that doesn't mean uh, that women are looking at the man's financial statement and choosing them that way. There are usually other issues at play, such as connection, things in common, love, um, a sense of play, a desire to uh, share value systems with someone else. Um, not just a blatant case of usury. So if we, you know, think about then, um, like I said, these feelings of not being good enough and how they're habituated and how we equate worthiness to what we were told in our families of origin, because that's 100% where it starts. You know, the good enough parent is 
always affirming the three or four year old child by saying, I see you, you're doing a great job, I'm so proud of you. Um, this is the way that the child starts to internalize the other and starts to believe that I'm good enough and I matter and I have confidence I can go out in the world. And of course, through the ages of kindergarten and middle school, children have all sorts of trials and tribulations where they falter and they feel bad about themselves, but then the parent props them up and says, you're doing a good job. Or if they're struggling with grades, they help them do better. And it's this constant, as I said, shuttling back and forth because we're building complexity and capability until, you know, when the child is 16, 17, 18 years old, they feel good about themselves. They don't need to run around at 30, 40, 50 years old, beating their chest and saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, the way a baby does on a playground. Um, and so these are the things that we have to either give ourselves if we didn't get them to begin with um, and certainly um, undo, deconstruct and reconstruct so that we feel more functional in the world. So take a look at um, the programming that no longer addresses your true needs um, and to you know, start to change your customary thinking. And that's worthy, I think, of examining on all fronts. Um, you know, this question of, even if you think about religion as an example, you know, many of us are born into and baptized into a religion with no say about it. And very few of us really get to examine those religions to decide later on, huh, does this make sense for me? Does this ring true for me? Is this something I believe or is it something that's carried over intergenerationally? And actually, I don't believe it at all. I want to go find out what's true for me. That's just one example. Another example can be something as simple as, <clears throat> you know, the kind of food you eat. And maybe you're eating food that's not particularly healthy or nutritious because you grew up in a family where there was poverty or, you know, budgetary needs. So um, your mother, you know, only prepared food that was, <clears throat> you know, instant food or food out of a box uh, because she was a single working mom and maybe you're doing better as an adult and you have access to farmer's markets and fresh fruits and vegetables and to ask yourself, wow, you know, might I want to take better care of myself if I can? What if I look at how habituated I am to eating mac and cheese and maybe that's not the most healthy thing for myself and while I love it, and I'm kind of addicted to it because I've been eating it my whole life, what would it feel like to give that up? What would happen if I craved it and I stopped eating it, but instead I just went and got some, you know, healthy food to eat instead um, and some cheese that was real cheese and not just cheese that came in a packet. Um, and I started to change my eating habits. That would be really challenging, but so much better for you over time. So these things have to be taken in small measures. They're not insurmountable by any means. Um, you have the capacity to do them because what we're talking about is how we are a series of pattern behaviors. And it's so hard for us to get out of our patterns because we're so automatic. But just the pattern of you know, exercise, for example, um, and if you don't have a value system around that and you haven't done it very much and you don't know how to do it, it can be super hard to start to change that pattern. But it is 100% doable if you're motivated to do it. Someone writes, I was emotionally and physically abused as a child as well as extremely shamed about everything relating to sex, which has had a devastating effect on my adult life. I'm sure it has. And I want to ask you if you have a book that you can recommend that would help me process these things, get over them, and have a happy life. Well, um, you can start by looking at uh, Wendy Maltz's book called The Sexual Healing Journey. Um, that is a beautiful book for abuse survivors. Um, and I think you're probably going to have to look at a lot of different books um, and also make sure that you're in therapy with a good therapist. Um, someone that understands the body and works with trauma um, because you can have a happy life, um, but it's going to take you a while to repair those parts of you that feel broken, but really what they are are disintegrated self-states. 
Um, and these self states really have to do with circuits from the brain down into the body. So reinstating those circuits requires that you do it in the presence of a trusted other. Um, and someone says that children that were emotionally abused um, can neglect self-care as adults, and that's true. Um, and I, I think this happens because, you know, neglect is worse than abuse. And we know this also from the data that um, when children don't learn to brush their teeth or eat well or shower, um, they have no compass um, for why they would do that. And they're going to end up with an abuser. Um, so all of this has to do with our conditioning. We do what we know. Um, if you don't know any better, if you don't know there's something called shoes, then why would you ever wear shoes? If you don't know that um, you should brush your teeth or your teeth fall out of your mouth and you've never seen a toothbrush or toothpaste, why should you know about that? And of course, you're going to end up with somebody who is abusive because that's what you grew up with. It's all conditioning. Um, and so someone says, can a lack of proper self-care actually motivate abusers to smell a victim leading to victimization? Well, sure. I mean, odor and smell, um, for example, fear has a very particular smell to it. And we know it when we smell it. And so all of those things are at play with victims and abusers. Um, you know, somebody who is, you know, a child who is, has been abused or is being abused or lacks any kind of parental supervision that's super insecure is the child that's most um, prey for child sexual predators. Um, they don't pick out the confident kids in the crowd, the kid that's going to tell them to, you know, buzz off or the kid that's going to tell their teacher or go home and tell their parent, like, you can't believe what happened today. They're going to pick the child in the back of the room that's dirty, that's unkempt, that clearly doesn't have supervision, and they're going to groom that child and befriend that child so they can sexually abuse that child. That's just how it goes. So the more confident we are in the world, the more capable we are of taking care of ourselves. Um, how might conditioning genes be influenced by premature birth? Um, additionally, we consider preemies who are treated by hospital staff and visitors wearing masks, uh, what attachment issues might arise. Well, we know that premature infants um, are typically premature because of high anxiety in the mother. And so that anxiety is there from the get-go. Um, and then, of course, there are a whole host of um, things that occur in the NICU being separated from the mother um, is going to have an attachment breach on that infant and what the caregiving setup is in those neonatal units. I mean, it depends from unit to unit. So there's naturally going to be a breach from the beginning and the parent, the mother is going to have to work double time to rectify that. But over time, if the mother is secure and she's contingent, uh, the mother and the infant should catch up with each other um, and it shouldn't, you know, over a couple of months probably. So when it comes to this matter of conditioning, um, ask yourself again, what conditioning did you receive from um, your caregivers, uh, your community and your culture, and maybe start to write them down and look at them um, and ask yourself, then what of these messages support my self image? What of these messages sort of destroy my self image, my relationships and my dreams? Um, and can you counter those negative programming by shining a light on your negative thinking? And so I think it's really useful to consider, um, for example, my mother grew up in a very strict household and so she was strict by any measure. That strictness served to give me a lot of capacity in life for discipline. So when I got home from school every day, I had to fold my clothes and put them away before I could play. And so I'm neat. She was obsessive compulsive in her neatness. I am not. I'm just a neat person. I keep my house clean. I like order. It makes me feel good and it helps me to function. I'm able to balance a checkbook because of her. Um, I'm able to, I don't lose things because of her. But I had to work long and hard in my own therapy to not be as uptight and rigid and judgmental as she was 
um, in order to function in the way I want it to function. So on the one hand, I can look at how problematic she was, and it really hurt me and impinged upon me as a child because it didn't give me the possibility and the space to explore and find out a lot of things in a creative way, but it also gave me things. So I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater in that regard. And that's, uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. I mean, I often say this is not about being on a witch hunt about, against your parents. They were who they were. They were dealt whatever pains and horrors they were dealt. And then they pass them on intergenerationally. And so what can you do to start to shift and change um, what you got and keep the good and toss out that which is useless bad or even shaming or problematic for you today so you can become the person that you were always meant to be and become your best self so i'm going to leave you with that note to really challenge your conditioning your negative thoughts to find a therapist if you've been harmed in any way you cannot do this by yourself um, and books are great and they're helpful but this is not a do-it-yourself program um, if you were terribly abused um, the problem is you are left alone, and so you cannot get out of it alone. You need someone to give you a hand to help pull you up out of that pain. And once they do that and you get enough help on board, you'll be able to take it from there um, for yourself. So on this day, with the many riots that have been going on, the unbelievable cultural conditioning that we're looking at, um, the pain and suffering that's going on, I want to challenge you to... Um, challenge your thoughts about what's going on today, good, bad, or otherwise, and see if you can open your lens and how you're looking at um, all of the actors on this stage. Those that seem like they're doing, you know, horrible, horrendous things, and those that seem to be doing things in a retaliatory way, and to really ask yourself and to put yourself in everybody's shoes and to say, wow, this is such a painful time for us right now in our culture, um, and how can we be curious how can we be open-minded? How can we ask more questions and have less judgment about what's going on? All right, so take good care, stay safe, and I look forward to talking to you in July.